Considering the Thousand Year Blood War arc is all about the Quincy race, their resurgence, and their attempted reshaping of the entire Bleach universe, while simultaneously diving into some of their previously unseen history, you'd be forgiven for thinking Ryuken Ishida, father of Uryu Ishida, and the self-proclaimed last Quincy, would have a big role to play in the story. So, readers were definitely surprised, to say the least, when outside of a great inclusion in the past flashback, Everything But The Rain, Ryuken barely makes an appearance at all. His notable absence is compounded by the fact that his son, Uryu, does have a somewhat pivotal role to play in these world-changing events, even if the general consensus there as well remains that Uryu's role was also too minimal. But the truth about Ryuken in the Thousand Year Blood War arc runs deeper than simply seeing him in action. In reality, Ryuken has been preparing for this eventuality in the shadows for years now, engineering his ultimate revenge in the hopes of bringing down the Quincy King once and for all. While we don't see a lot of it, something the anime looks to at least remedy a little bit, what we do discover turns out to be more crucial than almost anything else, and Ryuken turns out to be completely instrumental in the ultimate defeat of Yuhabak and the end of the war. So, in this video, we'll be taking a look at the role of Ryuken Ishida, the wider implications of what he's been working on, as well as the results of his work, the mythical Steel Silver Arrow, a major piece of Bleach lore that I feel often goes overlooked, both due to its late arrival in the story, and its relatively tiny amount of panel time with the audience, as well as the way it's integrated into the story itself. But before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach videos like this one every single week. Let's try and hit 200,000 subscribers before the anime comes back in July. That really would be absolutely amazing. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to give a massive everlasting shout out to everyone who is supporting me over there on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. It means the world to me. But a super easy way to support me is by checking out my second channel, Mr. Tomo Talks Games. I just uploaded another video over there the other day, my first game review. And I really would appreciate you going and checking it out, maybe hitting subscribe if you like what you see. If we could hit 5,000 subscribers over there, that would be a huge milestone. But regardless of how you choose to support me, even if it's just watching the videos, I really do appreciate each and every one of you, and thank you all so very much. And of course, before we start the video, if you hadn't guessed, there will be some major spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach to come. For one of the series' only Quincy up until this point, Ryuken's role in the Thousand Year Blood War arc is truly strange, if I had to be honest. While Uryu is joining up with the Vandenreich and following his own agenda, Ryuken is almost totally missing from the early stages of the arc. As mentioned earlier, a younger version of the character appears heavily in the Everything But The Rain flashback, which gives us a great glimpse into his years as a young adult, as well as a fresh perspective on both the modern-day Quincy race, the Ishida household, and their traditions and beliefs. What's even stranger, however, is that Ryuken's appearance here, while great to see, is only tangentially related at best to the overall Quincy aspect of this arc. Instead, the role he plays here is pivotal in the story of Masaki and Ishin's coming together. We do learn something of vital importance from this flashback, however. Ryuken eventually married Kane Katagiri, a mixed-blood Quincy with whom he fathered Uryu. Tragically, however, Katagiri was murdered when her Quincy powers and abilities were ripped away from her in a worldwide purge by Yuhabak upon his reawakening as he strove to restore his own strength, using the lives of half-blood Quincy across the globe as little more than sustenance. As Ishin finishes telling Ichigo this tale, we get our first look 
at present day Ryuken in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, standing in his office, gazing out of the window at the rain. A prominent photo of his late wife is also visible on his desk. His face, however, isn't visible, but you have to imagine he bears that same sense of loss and mourning every year that Ishin does, an unlikely bond that they share. Now this leads me on to something else. I want to talk briefly about the relationship shared between Yuha Bark and his flock, the Quincy, as it's one of my favourite aspects of both his character and the way Kubo chooses to depict the Quincy race in the final arc of Bleach. Yuha Bark and the Sternritter differ from Aizen and the Espada in a number of ways, but perhaps the most key is how they view their leader. Aizen, while of course being extraordinarily powerful, for the most part plays pretend at being a god, and while the Espada came together beneath him, they have their own agendas, their own reasons for following their new master, and for the most part are a totally disparate group of vicious thugs and personalities that are otherwise totally incompatible, brought together and united only really by his strength, a tenuous hold at best. Yuhabak, outside of the Soul King himself, is the closest thing to an actual god in Bleach, and the Sternritter are all united in their devotion to him on a fanatical scale. The Sternritter are true zealots, worshipping Yuhabak as their god king, willing to give their lives for him should he so desire it. While not every Sternritter feels exactly this way, the general consensus is that they exist for him, and they will do everything they can to please him. For example, Asnot lives in complete and total fear of Yuhabak at all times, terrified that the man who gave him everything will suddenly decide to strip him of it all at some point in the future. And that brings me nicely to Ryuken and Katagiri. While Soken was a member of the Vandenreich at some point in the past before being banished due to his differing views on their advancement, it seems likely that Ryuken never was. So his relationship with Yuhabak, or at least the legend of Yuhabak before his revival, is hard to pin down. Yuhabak openly believes that all Quincy are his children and that he is their all-father, and because he gave them life, because his power and blood runs through their veins, they also belong to him. Yuhabak even states to Ichibei that he believes all things in this world exist solely for his taking. This twisted, warped power dynamic is one of my favourite things about Yuhabak as a character. When Ichigo confronts him at the end of the season, Series, the Quincy King loudly proclaims that Masaki gave birth to Ichigo and then later died to feed Yuhabak's own strength, and that was her only purpose in life. And he doesn't believe that for her there could have been any greater happiness in that fate. It's truly messed up that Yuhabak genuinely doesn't see these people who actually follow him, who presumably look to him for some kind of guidance as little more than his own playthings to do with as he pleases and then to toss away once they've outlived any kind of usefulness to him. I really enjoy Yuha Bark being this almost bastardised version of a messiah, that he has the power to give people in need something that will help them, something that they desire, and yet as far as he's concerned, the moment he does that, he owns them for life and that he is willing to strip all of that away and take it back to him whenever he sees fit. And so Yuhabak's abuse of his children is a really intriguing thread and a fascinating character trait, one that I'd have loved to have seen pulled at a little bit more. But as a Quincy, before the Owls Valen, it's interesting to wonder how much Ryuken knew about Yuhabak and if he at all worshipped him. I like the idea that he and all Quincy worshipped Yuhabak as their god to some degree, but after Katagiri's death, rather than accepting it as her predestined fate, Ryuken decided instead that it was time to destroy God once and for all, and planned his vengeance ever since. But outside of that sliver of a shot of Ryuken in his office, that's really all we get for him for the first two thirds of the entire arc, which is complete insanity when you think about it.
Thankfully, the anime has gone some way to fixing this already, providing us with a better look at both Ryuken and Uryu in these early sections of the story, as well as a simple timeline of events leading to Uryu's supposed betrayal. But after this, deep into the Varvelt arc, we're treated to a very surprising, out of nowhere flashback that, unknown to us at the time, would foretell the end of the war itself. A crack of light splits the darkness as a young Uryu walks in on his father, who is dressed in his surgical gear and performing what looks to be a gruesome autopsy on his own wife's body. It's like something out of a horror movie, presumably, for young Uryu. For him, it must have been a distressing sight. And being, of course, childlike and naive at that age, he begs his father to stop cutting up his mother's body as she's already dead. However, Ryuken simply turns to him with what looks to me like a sympathetic glance, like he wishes he could tell Uryu what he was trying to achieve, but he thinks the boy is just too young and presumably wouldn't understand. Even though this flashback is a mere page long, it's of vital importance. Although we didn't know it in the moment, Ryuken is in fact cutting his way into Katagiri's own heart to retrieve something. It's difficult to know exactly how much Ryuken knows at this point in the story, or if he's just in his own grief, desperately searching for an answer as to why she died. What we do know is that he stumbled upon that answer during his autopsies. A bit later, as the battles heat up in Varvelt and Ichigo confronts Yuhabak himself in the throne room, Ryuken and Ishin arrive in the Quincy Palace, having utilised the Gate of the Sun thanks to a key Soken stole when he was banished from the Empire. Ryuken is now dressed in full Quincy regalia for the first time in the present day, presumably ready to face the end no matter what form that takes. A little later again, as the final battle for the fate of all worlds rages on, Uryu leaves the site of his battle with Yugram Hashwolf, desperately trying to reach his friends. As he runs, an arrow is blasted at his feet from afar. Looking up in shock, Uryu sees none other than his father, Ryuken, staring down at him from on high. When Uryu asks what he's doing there, Ryuken explains that he came to give Uryu that very arrowhead he just fired at him. And sure enough, Uryu looks down at the ground and realises the Heilig file that was shot is unusual. Indeed, the reishi part of the arrow flickers and simply blows away in the wind, leaving behind a smoking silver arrowhead with an intricate, ornate detailing. Ryuken reveals the truth to Uryu. He discovered that when a Quincy is struck by Ausvalen, they develop a silver blood clot in their heart and die. The Ausvalen in general is weirdly inconsistent in its portrayal, as I discuss in my dedicated video on it, but we can surmise from this that every Quincy directly hit by the light is doomed to die shortly, and probably fairly shortly afterwards, even if they're not reduced to a skeleton on impact. During his autopsy on his wife, Ryuken discovered this blood clot, removed it, and forged an arrowhead from it. This arrowhead, known as Still Silver, contains the power of Ausvalen itself, and more metaphorically, the revenge of all Quincy who have died by Yuhabark's hands. As Uryu realises this is what his father was doing that night, Ryuken tells him to take the arrow, as he's the one who should fire it. Though we don't see Ryuken again now in the source material, the effects of his work, his vengeance, are felt. A mere two chapters later, as Yuhabak overwhelms Ichigo and begins to tear the very world apart, a striking silver arrow bursts through his chest. Uryu's hit has landed, and as he breathes a sigh of relief, someone begins speaking. I assume this is Ryuken just continuing his explanation to Uryu from their last scene together, but he says that Soken once told him, presumably after the death of Katagiri, that the silver the silver that forms from Ausvalen is known as the Silver of Stillness, and by mixing it with the blood of the one who performed Ausvalen in the first place, it will, much like that very power, 
strip them of all their abilities for just a moment. And of course, this is exactly what happens. Yuhabak, with an incredibly satisfying look of terror and shock on his face, has his powers removed instantly the moment the arrow pierces him as the power of the still silver courses through his veins. And in that moment of human-like vulnerability, Ichigo delivers the killing blow to Yuhabak, ending the war for good. And that's it for Ryukin's role, his engineered revenge, his master plan that it seems he's been waiting many years to carry out. There's no denying that the still silver arrow is one of the most controversial elements of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and I think a lot of people are actually wondering if the ending will be changed at all in the anime. But personally, I hope it isn't, or at the very least, I hope that aspect is kept intact. Yes, the Arrowhead is a deus ex machina, that literary term we all love so much. Yuhabak had clearly become so obscenely, absurdly powerful that the only way to actually kill him to defeat this threat was to find some way of removing his abilities entirely. And nobody in Bleach, certainly no one left at that point in the battle, can actually do that. So something has to give. But I actually think that thematically, the arrow is a very fitting way to finish Yuhabak off. It allows Uryu to be included in the finale on a personal level, as well as the echo of his father. And I absolutely love the notion that the arrow represents all the Quincy who have been abused by Yuhabak over the years, who have suffered at his hands due to him thinking it's his right to control them and their lives, who have had their lives cut short by his belief they all owe him everything. To see that look on his face, his eyes wide with horror as it finally comes back to bite him is very satisfying in my opinion. Turning the Ausvalen back on its wielder is a really cool way to make him lose everything. Plus, to give Kubo credit where it's due, the arrowhead was foreshadowed, a good 20 chapters or so from before it was actually used. Now, admittedly, there was no way we would have ever gleaned the idea of the arrowhead from that one page of flashback, but it is there. This is different to, say, the final Getsuga Tensho, where we'd heard no whisper of, nor seen any inkling of foreshadowing beforehand. Ishin just reveals it's possible to Ichigo on the route to the final battle. The still silver arrow isn't perfect, but it's absolutely not the most egregious case we've seen. So if it's not perfect, and it does have its problems narratively, how would I change things? How would I have the anime do things differently? Because it's all well and good saying it's a deus ex machina, but how would I actually go about changing it? We've already established that I don't think the arrow itself is the problem. Its inclusion feels a bit rushed, but I think that's the fault of the battle itself more than the arrow as a device. The very final fight against Yuhabak is too short, too quick, and there's nowhere near enough lead in time before the arrow is actually used. So that's one issue that I think the fight is over too quickly and should be extended where it can. And really any extension would help at all. The second is an issue that I think the anime is already beginning to rectify. And that's that I think it's a bit cheap to have an arc based on the Quincy, yet exclude Ryuken for almost the entirety of it, only to bring him back at the very end with the weapon needed to win the day. By already including more of Ryuken and hopefully continuing to do so in the following parts, it'll make this moment, this revelation, feel more earned. And finally, while I do like that Kubo foreshadowed the arrow a little bit, I would have liked to have seen a bit more. Maybe when the Ausvalen is used during the second invasion, we can hear something about the silver blood clot being created in the hearts of the Sternritter. Let's take Basby. He's fully struck by the Ausvalen's light, but survives. It would be cool if during his turncoat moment with the Gote 13, where he decides to work with them to reach the Royal Palace, he mentions he's on borrowed time because of the silver blood clot. Maybe he can even already feel it beginning to take effect. And then maybe Myori briefly wonders to himself if that silver could be harvested from their corpses, either once they've inevitably collapsed, or when Yuhabak probably kills them. It's the kind of morbid thing I could see Myori casually bringing up in some kind of observation. And so that's how I feel about the contentious issue of the Still Silver Arrow, which I think feeds into the overall bigger topic of Bleach's ending itself, which I also want to make a video about in the future. I really enjoy the fact that 
Born out of grief, the Silver Arrow is Ryuken's and the entire Quincy race's final declaration of intent to sever themselves from Yuhabak's influence once and for all, so that future Quincy's can move forward without his lingering shadow. But that's it for the video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below what you think of Ryuken's inclusion in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, what you think of the still Silver Arrow as a device used to defeat Yuha Bark. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. And also let me know if you agree with my points, what you'd like to see the anime do in regards to changing how the still Silver Arrow is incorporated. I'd love to hear all of that down in the comments below. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Check out Mr. Tomo Talks Games for more games coverage over there. And until next time, guys, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.